found on page 109 of the Old Testament in the Pew Bibles. Our New Testament reading is to be found on page 310 of the Pew Bibles, and it comes from the first chapter of Revelations, commencing at verse 9 and carries on through the second chapter until verse 7. One like a son of man. I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus, was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. On the Lord's day, I was in the spirit and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet which said, Write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. I turned round to see the voice that was speaking to me, and when I turned I saw seven golden lampstands, and among the lampstands was someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe reaching down to his feet and with a golden sash round his chest. His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp double-edged sword. His face was like the sun, shining in all its brilliance. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead, and behold, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and Hades. Write, therefore, what you have seen, what is now and will take place later. The mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and of the seven golden lampstands is this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. The Church in Ephesus. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your deeds, your hard work and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked men, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken your first love. Remember the height from which you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. But you have this in your favour. You hate the practices of Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Hear the word of God. Thanks. Ever Father, I am so grateful to be back behind our lectern. I'm so privileged to be here this morning, Lord, to proclaim your word. And we are so thankful, as we have said in a number of different ways today, Lord. We are so thankful that we're able to gather easily 
and without any restraint. Father, I pray that this verse and this sermon which I have before you will honor you and will send us into the world, Lord, to be good harvesters of your crop. Thank you, Father. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please, will you sit? Over the years, actually, since we've been here, I've had a number of requests to say, won't you do something uh, on Revelation? And while we were away, somebody said to me, I wish somebody would like you, Dennis, would do something on Revelation. So over the next uh, umpteen weeks, we're going to be looking at the seven letters to the churches. It will probably take us into Advent, somewhere along the line. I just thought it would be interesting to begin, before we get to the seven letters, to look at some of the background of what was going on in this first chapter of the book of Revelation. And you'll notice I said Revelation. Many, many people call it Revelations. It's not Revelations. It's The Bible says it is the revelation of Jesus Christ to the church. So it's one, Revelation. So if we can just have a look at that first section we were reading on. It says, I turned and saw that was speaking to me when I turned and saw seven golden lampstands, and among the lampstands was someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe reaching down to his feet, and with a golden sash around his chest. The hair on his head was white like wool, as white as snow, and the eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in the furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. And in his right hand he held seven stars, and coming out of his mouth was a sharp double-edged sword. His face was like the sun, shining in all its brilliance. We're going to come back to that in a moment. But just a little bit of background before we even look at who this strange figure was standing in the midst of this revelation that John had. John was about 90 years old. He was probably living at the time in Ephesus, and he was probably part of that whole persecution of preaching the gospel that he was sent to the island. Did I say Ephesus or Patmos? I said Ephesus. He was living in Ephesus, and he was probably sent as part of the persecution and the arrest to the island of Patmos, which is about 100 kilometers from nowadays Kusadasi which is in nowadays Turkey. That's the old Ephesus. If you have a look at the island of Patmos, you can see how little it is in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea. So, because he was there, and he was probably doing what Nelson Mandela did on Robben Island, he was probably crushing rocks at the age of 90. He had this wonderful, wonderful vision. And the opening vision is this wonderful vision of this one who is like a son of man. Now, if you go back to the book of Daniel, you'll find in that wonderful story of the fiery furnace, where Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were in the fiery furnace, there was one like a son of man in their midst. And they said... But we only put three in there. There's another one now. And of course they came out without any hair on their head being singed. One like a son of man. And we immediately know that this is the risen Christ in this vision. So, what was he actually saying? He was saying there are seven golden lampstands. These were seven churches. Where were those seven churches? we see one in each of the places where the letters are going. So at the end of this wonderful vision, John would have written seven letters, and he would have sent seven letters to each of those churches, including all of them. Those were, those were churches of the time, yes, but they also represent every single church that exists now and has existed since then. So we can't say, oh, no, no, no. This letter to Ephesus doesn't actually apply to us. 
It applies to each one of us. I was, I was uh, tempted to ask Elise to read the names of these churches. And then I decided, now I better not do that. So the seven churches were Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, and Sardis, and Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Those were the seven churches. Today, obviously, we read about the church of Ephesus. He says there were also seven stars. So we see that the lampstands are the seven churches, and we see that the seven stars are the seven messengers or the seven pastors or ministers in charge of that particular church. Then he goes on to describe, does John, what this vision looked like. It says he had, he was clothed in a robe reaching to his feet, girded across his chest with a golden sash. That gives us an indication of his priestly appearance. His hair was white like a wool. Wisdom. Hair like... That's why we are all wise. Because we have hair white as wool. And it talks about the fact that he had burnished bronze feet. That talks about omniscience. In other words, omniscience is knowing all. And he, he, his feet are now all over the place. Remember he said to his disciples, You will do greater things than I have done. Why did he say that? Because there was only one of him. There are many of us. But now we see this omniscient, all-knowing, omnipresent Jesus Christ. And it says his, his voice was like the sound of many waters. That's his word. That's the word of God. So he is proclaiming this whole vision to the people of Asia Minor, nowadays Turkey. It's a wonderful, wonderful picture of Jesus Christ. And what happens when John sees this? He falls down like a dead man. What was going on in these churches? I said it was persecution that sent John to the island of Patmos. But listen what was going on. There was tribulation, there was persecution, the encroachment of worldliness, false teachers, false doctrine, compromise, coldness, indifference. Think of the church today. Think of what's happening in the church today. There is tribulation. There is persecution. There is the encroachment of worldliness. False teachers, false doctrine, compromise, coldness, indifference. Only two of the seven churches were regarded as being faithful. Only two of the seven. All the others were not commended. Only these two were commended. Five of them were in severe danger. Ephesus, the one we're looking at today. I'm not sure if we're going to even be looking at Ephesus today, but we'll get there. Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, and Laodicea. And he warns them, does our Lord Jesus, through John, to say, you are in danger. And in fact, you will see a little bit later when we get to Ephesus, Ephesus, he says, if you don't change your ways, I'm going to remove your pastor from you. And what is so interesting is that if you go to Kusadasi today, there is no more Ephesus church. It died as a result of this particular letter. So, the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, the one who walks among the seven golden lampstands, says this, and he says, who is that? That's the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of Man, pictured in the vision. And the Lord is the speaker, and it is He who is speaking to the church. Now we come to the second letter. He is the first and the last, and He has life to come. So we begin now to look at this particular church. And I want you to tell you this. That of all the churches, the church in Ephesus probably had the very, very best start. Just think of some of the teachers. Aquila, Priscilla, Apollos, Paul, Timothy, Tychus, John. These were all people. And you know what the beauty was about the church of Ephesus? Was that they started off on the right foundation. The foundation 
of Jesus Christ. What do we know about Ephesus before we even begin to look at the letter? We know that the Romans called it Luminasia. In Latin, the light of Asia. It had the greatest harbor in Asia Minor. It was a place where goods were brought in, sold, much industry going on. Four great highways coming into Ephesus, great trade routes. Most of all, and importantly enough, it was called by the Romans the Highway of the Martyrs. The road between Ephesus and Rome, where the Christians were thrown to the lions, was known as the Highway of the Martyrs. It was a free city. All sorts of religions were allowed, except, of course, persecution of Christians. And what was very, very interesting about Ephesus, and most of you will know this, is that it had this great religion called the religion of Artemis or Diana. I remember as a child when those huge screens, I can't even remember, Cinerama. Do you remember Cinerama cinemas? My dad says to us, I've got a surprise for you today. But I'm not telling you where we go. And he took us to Cinerama in Joburg. And I will never forget the name of the movie. It was called The Seven Ancient Wonders of the World. In Cinerama. Did you go to Cinerama? Wonderful experience. The statue of Diana was one of the greatest ancient wonders of the world. Together with the hanging gardens of Babylon and, and, the, and the Giza pyramids and all those others. So, now finally... We get to verse 2. No, no, I don't want you to get put it back. I'm just wondering how we're doing for time. Do you think I should stop? Do you think we should stop here before we go into the letter? Just a few more minutes, right. Let's get to verse 2, where we want to be right now. There is a commendation for this church. He says, I know your deeds your toil and perseverance, and that you cannot tolerate evil men. And you put to test those who call themselves apostles, and they are not, and you found them to be false. You have perseverance and have endured for none my name's sake, and have not grown weary. I'll tell you what, if that was a church in this town, you would join it. You've not grown weary. You've put up with all sorts of things. You've put up with evil and you've called out evil. They weren't lazy. They weren't indifferent. They were busy. They were giving everything that they had to the worship of Jesus and his church. They were not going to church for entertainment. And I must tell you once again, and please forgive me for saying this, but we went to some churches while we were away. The entertainment value is very high. The cappuccinos are very, very good. But I'm afraid, and forgive me for saying this, that a lot of those people are onlookers, watchers, love to eat the fruit of the harvest without wanting to put any work into the harvest. So, not only were these people known for their deeds and their toil, but their perseverance, their patience, their persistence, they worked through all these things. What a wonderful church. Not lazy, not looking for instant gratification. And beyond that, verse 3 says, you cannot tolerate evil men. You cannot tolerate evil men. A well-taught church. Sound theology, as I said. The foundation, the one and only foundation. Many evil people came into congregations, particularly in the early church. Satan was infiltrating those early churches all the time. Judaizers, false teachers were everywhere. But they did not put up with evil. I've said this before, and I'll say it again. The church of Jesus Christ is being infiltrated. 
to this very day, it's being infiltrated. And we must not be surprised as we have experienced in this church when an individual arrives and starts to give everybody the grills. We mustn't be surprised because he does that. And finally, I want to end here now. Verse 6 says this. In particular, they hated the Nicolaitans, one heretical group which God in Christ hated too. I can tell you nothing about the Nicolaitans. We don't know anything about them, except that historians say they were characterized by extreme indulgence, filth, and uncleanness. They also tried to infiltrate the church, but they were rejected. And so we finally now, and this is where we're going to start next week, we go from a commendation to a condemnation. That's hard. We've heard so much good about this church, but we now go from a commendation to a condemnation. I have this against you, that you have lost your first love. You have left your first love behind. You still come, you still work, you still give, you still believe, you still sing, you still hold to the truth, but I know that you don't love me like you did. You don't love me like you did. On that sad note, I'm going to leave it this morning and we will pick up next week where we've left off to say, what is the Lord saying to you and to me about rediscovering that first love? In the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you very much, Roseanne.